Well, and good morning once again. It's a great day today. Will you please open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. If you're new here to this church, we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, all the way through the Bible so you get the full counsel of God's word. So last week, we finished chapter 2. This week, we begin chapter 3. And in fact, chapter 3 is only 13 verses. It's a relatively short chapter, so we'll be doing the full chapter this morning. The title of our message today is called How to Love. How to Love. So there was an elderly couple driving in their car. Man was driving, his wife was riding in the passenger seat. And as is sometimes the case, when he was driving, he didn't notice that the speed limit had switched from 55 down to 25. He got pulled over by a police officer. Problem is, he couldn't hear all that well. So the officer came up to the side of the car and he said, sir, I need to see your license and registration. And the man looked at his wife and he said, what did he say? And she said, he needs to see your license and registration. Oh, okay, so he gets them out and he hands them to the police officer. And the officer says, do you know what I pulled you over for today? It's because you were speeding. You were going really fast in a 25. He looked at his wife and said, what did he say? She looked back and said, he said you were driving way too fast. Oh man, I'm, I'm very sorry, officer, I didn't, didn't realize this. The officer looked at the man's license, he says, oh, you're from Wichita, Kansas. He says, my, my cousin lives in Wichita, probably the ugliest man you'll ever see in your life. And he kind of gave a little laugh. And the man looked over at his wife and said, what did he say? She said, he thinks you're his cousin. Maybe not the best marriage there, huh? We all know people like this, don't we? While it's funny, we do know people that have gone on in life and have really been challenged in relationships. Some of us today may be challenged in relationships, but let me take your mind back to how you grew up. What were the relationships like that were modeled to you? Sometimes, some people grow up in great homes with parents who love each other, are respectful, go to church, and they have modeled the love of Christ in their relationships, and that's wonderful, and God bless you if that was you, wonderful. We need more marriages and families that model Jesus Christ and, and, and his love for us. But we weren't all so lucky, were we? Some of us grew up in homes where the love of Christ was not modeled at all. Sometimes the relationship was just flat out dysfunctional. And because of that, we've been modeled something and perhaps we've fallen in the same footsteps, wanting something different but not knowing how to do it. Maybe you see relationships around you and think to yourself, I would love to do that or be like that, and you think, well, how do I do it though? What does it look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. Today we're going to talk about three ways to show biblical love. It's an interesting thing about relationships is that the entire Bible, from front to back, talks about relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationships with one another. And our relationship with God always affects our relationships with one another. Changes the way that we relate to one another and it should happen because our love for God is reflected in the love that we show for one another. Jesus said if they, uh, that you are to love one another, and Jesus said, as I've loved you, and he said, and by this all will know you're my disciples. So how do we do that? Well, if your Bible's open, 1 Thessalonians chapter three, let's read verses one through five together. It says, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be sh uh, shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For, in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation, just as it happened, and you know. For this reason, when we could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Let's pause here and pray. Father, we thank you once again for this day, Lord, for the house that you provided here, Lord. 
for your word that we have before us. Lord, we've gotten up, we've gotten dressed, we made it to church today, Lord, to hear from you. So we pray, Lord, that you will speak to us through your word today, that you will shine a light on your truth, Lord, and that you will change our lives from the inside out. We pray these things, Lord, in your holy name. Amen. So, verse 1 of chapter 3 begins with the word therefore. Whenever we see that word, we have to ask what it's there for. Because the word therefore always connects it to a previous point. And Paul had been sharing with this church, in fact, the final verse there in chapter 2 was he says, you are our glory and joy. You see, Paul had been checking in on this church and getting a report from them and They were, in fact, the object of his affection. All of the churches that he planted, but this one was especially worrisome for the apostle because he was there for only a short amount of time, three weeks, in fact. And then he was run out of town by an angry mob. We'll get into more of that in a minute, but Paul loved them, and therefore he sent someone to them. He says there in verse one, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, because we loved you, he says, we could no longer endure it. We thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. The whole point of what he's sharing right now is that He was wondering how they were doing. He wanted to know what the state of their faith was. How was the church doing? And he couldn't stand it anymore. You see, in these days, if we put ourselves kind of back into his shoes, um, he couldn't just simply text them. He couldn't email. He couldn't FaceTime or Twitter or X. Yeah, I'm pretty separated from all that stuff, but I know it exists. But because of modern day technology, it's pretty easy for us to connect with people even though they're maybe even countries away. I still can contact my friends in Mexico through WhatsApp. They have Mexican numbers, it's challenging to text, but I can contact them through internet. It's it's wonderful, I can check in with somebody I haven't seen in years. Paul couldn't do that. And so the only way he could find out how they were doing was by sending a runner. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if, if, if you were the Apostle Paul and, and, and you planted a church in Orlando and you're down here and you're wondering how they're doing and you're worried about them, you'd be like, you know, hey, Timothy, come here, I got a job for you. Yeah? Um, pack a bag, because <laughs> you're going to Orlando. Orlando? Yes, there's a church there I need you to check on. I mean, that's a fairly big undertaking to do, but this was the only thing he could do. He did the best thing that he could do In lieu of picking up a phone or texting, he sent someone there to find out. Why? Because he loved them and he wanted to find out how they were doing. And also we find out, it says here, to to establish and encourage you concerning your faith. Let's just pause here and let's just make our point right now. What does love practically look like in a relationship? Number one, it's checking in. It's checking in with them. How are you doing? When you care about somebody and they're on your mind, you check in with them, you find out, how are you doing? And and in this particular case, he found out they were going through something difficult. He knew the church was going through some sort of tribulation or persecution. So here's Paul in the modern day context, picking up his cell phone essentially and texting them, how are you doing today? I was thinking about you, I'm worried about you because of these, and I heard you going through something difficult. He checked in with them and notice it cost him something. Did you notice he says, I thought it good to be left in Athens alone in verse one. Now for Paul to be left alone, this is a big deal. Paul had a ministry of planting churches and if you read the book of Acts, it didn't always go easy for him. It was good to have other Christians around him to encourage him, but also good to delegate the work. I had a pastor tell me years ago, if you wanna survive in ministry, delegate or die. Find out, you know, raise people up, teach, show them how to do things and let them do it on their own because you'll do a whole lot more work. One can do the work of one, two can do the work of three. So Paul had a lot of people around him helping him, but at this point, he only had a few guys and he sent them off to go get word to find out how they're doing. But I love what he says, encourage them and establish them. Establish and encourage them. What does it mean to establish somebody? Well, you remember a few years ago, we had a little windstorm come through here? We, we gave it a name, we called it Ian, Hurricane Ian, category four hurricane, and for those of you who are here, uh, and, you, and you, 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 you wrote out the storm. Um, I wrote out the storm in our old house. And it, it, was a, it was an experience, man. And the next day, when we went outside, I mean, to say it looked like a war zone, 
<laughs> it just did. There was stuff everywhere. There was pieces of roofing, there was pieces of, of, of insulation, there were trees, there were power lines, all of the road signs had been bent flat to the road and just, you know, it just was a disaster. And we got a couple blocks down and I ran into this guy. He's a, he's, he, he lives about maybe three blocks down from me, maybe four. I'm not sure exactly for, as the crow flies, but I know this guy because he, he was this huge muscly guy that used to, he has these massive bulldogs, he walks by my house. And I thought, there is like the scariest looking picture, right? A big muscle bound guy with two bulldogs. But he was a really nice guy. We got to be friends and we were talking about stuff. And after the hurricane, I went by his house and I said, hey, how did your house do? And he said, oh, my house, it did great until somebody's carport landed on my pool cage and took out the whole side of my house. I was like, oh, you mean your house made it? And then somebody else, a, a, like a carport hit it? He's like, yes. And, and there it is in the backyard. Took out his whole pool cage, the side of his house, piece of his roof, everything. This somebody's carport landed. I said, you any idea where it came from? He's like, I have no idea. He goes, I don't even know anybody's got a carport. I, I, I've never seen this thing. It just showed up. I'm like, wow. Okay, well, I mean, it's a hurricane, yeah. And I checked on another one of my neighbors and I was looking over and I said, how did your house do? He says, great. Well, at least it was until my carport flew off. <laughs> huh, any idea where that thing went? He's like, no. I was like, I do. Uh, be, don't talk to him for, give him some time. But the reason that carport flew off clearly is because it was not firmly established in the ground. It, 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 it broke its footings and, and rightfully so, it was a lot of wind. The storm came and blew it away. But as Christians, we are to be firmly established in our faith. And this is what Paul was telling Timothy he wanted, them, he wanted to do for them. Establish them in the faith. What does that mean? That means he called them up to help them out when they were going through a tough time by sharing the truths of the gospel. Hey, Jesus is with you. Yes, you're going through a trial right now. Yes, these people are coming out, but they don't know what they're doing. The battle is spiritual. Pray for them. Pray for your enemies. The church has to go on. Heaven is real. You need to continue to preach the gospel. And by the way, it's hard now, but you've got an eternity in heaven. And he would have been there preaching these truths to this church, establishing them in the faith. Why? Because the storm is brewing and the wind is blowing and they needed to be established. Otherwise, as Paul said, I'm worried he says here in verse four, for in fact, I told you before when you're with you that you would suffer tribulation. He told them it was gonna happen. But if we back up to verse three, he says that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. He was worried they were gonna get blown over. In verse five, he says, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. What he was really worried about was that going through this hard time, they were gonna just completely throw away their faith, that Satan was tempting them to just throw it all away, quit going to church, sit at home, and feel sorry for themselves. You know, we talked about this a few weeks ago, and I know that, that it's, it's a hard verse for, for us to comprehend or even understand sometimes, but Paul wrote to Timothy, and he says, all who desire to live godly will experience persecution. When your life looks differently than the world, the world will inherently persecute those who are different. And not only that, but that, that you know, there's, there's a lot going on spiritually with people, and sometimes they lash out, and sometimes they get mad, and sometimes, sometimes they will say things or even do things that are contrary to what the Bible says to do. They're not gonna love you, they're gonna hate you, and this is what Jesus said. They hated me before it hated you, but the world is gonna hate you. And Paul had taught them this in the short time that he was there in the three weeks. And this is a reality, this is something that they were experiencing in. But they were firmly rooted, they were grounded in the faith, and then he told Timothy, encourage them. You're doing great. You're doing great. Have you ever been through something difficult and then had somebody that you knew, a good Christian person who loves you, call you up just to say, how you doing? Now, whether you tell them anything or not, you know that person cares about you and cared enough at least to reach out and say something. This is the body of Christ, guys. This is what we are called here to do. Now before you say, well wait pastor, I went through something difficult and you only texted me one time. Yeah, but there's a whole church here. This is why we're talking about, this is how we love one another. We all have this responsibility. We check in with one another and if you love people, this is what you do. This is what practical love looks like. Paul was left alone. He sent Timothy to go find word to establish and encourage them because he was worried about what they were going through and notice this, it will always cost you something. It will cost you something. Paul had to be left alone, that's what it cost him. It cost him some time without Timothy. Man, he had to send Timothy, you can imagine how long it took him to get there, 
and then he spent some time then, and then he had to come back. I'm old enough to remember writing letters. You remember that? Required a piece of paper and a pen, and then and, you, know, you had to write out everything, and you had to write illegibly, and if you crossed anything out, your mom wouldn't let you send it because it looked like trash, you had to rewrite it. Yeah, happened to you too. And then you had to get a stamp, and then you had to write the address correctly on the right spot, otherwise it wouldn't get delivered, remember that? And then you would send it out, and then hopefully you wrote the address correct, and then you would send it off, and then you know, it would come back, and, and, and it would take some time. And they'd respond to what you said. And if it came from grandma, maybe it had $5 in it because that's the way my family rolled. That was awesome. But it did cost you a little bit of time. What does it cost you today? Very little. A moment of picking up your phone and calling that person and saying, how you doing? What's going on? Well, Paul checked in with them. He checked in with them and you know what? The word he got back was very exciting, verse six. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy by us. with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Oh man, so at this point, as he's sort of going back, and we had chapter one and two, so we've already kind of gone through this, but but he's sort of reiterating this fact that when Timothy came back with good news about how they were doing, just to put this in 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 a more updated term, he was stoked, he was so happy. He was happy they were doing well. Look at what he says. He has come to us, he brought us good news of your faith and love. Faith and love are the two foundational hallmarks of Christianity. Faith in God, loving one another. And when he, those are the two things he came back. Hey, they're doing great in faith, they trust God. They're reading his word and they're putting their faith in God. They're putting their trust in him. And you know what? And they're a very loving church. They were loving to one another. I just wanna pause from our teaching for just a moment and I just say, hey, can, can we do that here? Can we be a really loving church? You know what that looks like? When somebody new comes here, and let's just walk ourselves through the, through the sanctuary doors for the very first time. I mean, all of you came here first time at some point. But how cool is it if you show up to a church, and by the way, a lot of times when people come to church, especially if it's the first time, their expectations aren't usually generally that good. Um, they're nervous, it's a group of people they don't know, uh, it's a new building, it's a new surrounding, they don't know if they'll be accepted. You know, some churches have gone a little overboard on the legalistic side of things and have you know, caused people to be upset about how they dress or what they look like and, and, and so a lot of times people come in and they just expect the old shaking finger of the Lord, you know, telling them how bad they are. What if they just came and they were greeted by four or five people on the way in and somebody who smiled and was nice to them and genuinely cared and, and took the time to put interest into their life and w- walked them in and showed them and talked to somebody, what if we all did that? How cool would that be? How loving would that feel to walk into a church and everybody greet you as though they haven't seen you in a long time? And you feel welcome and you feel loved and you feel, you know what? It, you can mess a lot of things up in a church but if people feel loved, that's it. That's the pinnacle of success for a church. When somebody comes to me and says, hey, I came for the first time and I just wanna tell you, man, it was, it was such a loving place. Everybody was so nice to me and people were asking me if I needed anything. That's, we nailed it. And by the way, I get that a lot, which means we are doing that, which means many of you are doing the work of the ministry. But let's all do it. And Paul is saying that right here. He's saying your faith and your love It's great. He also says, and that you always have good remembrance to see us. Now, there was a lot of people who were trash-talking Paul. They were saying that he didn't love them because he didn't stick around, he wasn't coming to see them, and so there was a lot of murmuring going on about Paul, and he wasn't there to defend himself, but he found out the church wasn't phased by it. They weren't buying into all that mess. They were hearing it, yeah, 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 but we will love Paul, we want to see him, and so he's excited. He says, therefore, brethren, verse seven, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. He says, for now we live because you're doing well, I am full of life. That is awesome. He says we are comforted by your faith. And this was a big deal to Paul, why? Because he was going through something difficult as this letter arrived. As a minister 
of God, it's not always easy. We've seen it. We saw in the Old Testament the life of Elijah. Elijah was called to go and give some very bad news to a very evil king and then go off and live in a cave and survive by a stream and birds bringing him food for a while. And when he got out there, he had nothing but the birds and his thoughts. And you know, he just, at some point, he got really discouraged. In the New Testament, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, had a great mission. He accomplished his mission. He saw the Messiah. He saw the, the Spirit of God come down on him like a dove. He got to baptize Jesus. Coolest pastor moment in the scriptures right there. And yet later on, he's thrown into jail, and he sends a couple guys to Jesus to be like, hey, are you who you say you are or what? Life is not going the way I expected. He got discouraged. And Paul, man, everywhere he went, he, 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 he was in it, man. And he, he had a lot of conflict. You know, it's, it's funny, when I got into ministry, I, I know that I'd, I had a lot of pastors who were friends, and I'd gone to conferences, and I remember hearing from people how hard it is. They would say, oh, it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard. It's going to be tough. Well, I tell you what, when you pastor, tough has a face on it. It is. It, it, there are challenging moments. There are dry seasons where it seems like all you have is conflict and problems. You want to make a pastor happy? Tell him good stuff. Tell him about the life that God has given you and the good things he's done in your heart. Recently, somebody had given me a report. They said, I was, in the, I was shopping in Publix, and uh, this, this lady cut me off and gave me a dirty look. And he says, man, in my previous life, I would have let her have it, he says. But then, that scripture you gave me about loving people came up, and your face came up on my mind. And I, so I started praying for her right there and there. I was like, praise God. Why did my face come up? Like, did I do something? <laughs> my pastor Mike, he, he, he encouraged his whole congregation to bake a cake for those who, who had, you know, if somebody's offended you, bake them a cake. He went home, he had 30 cakes on his front patio, so. So I'm not gonna ask for anything lest I find that out myself. But. but Paul clearly saw his success in them. He didn't see his own success and use them to make himself successful. He saw their success as his success. They're doing good, so he lives. He gets word that they're doing well and it's a shot in the arm for the ministry. He's had a hard go for a little while. He's in Athens right then ministry was not going well. He had some really hardship. He just got out of jail. He was run out of town a couple of times. He's seen a couple of riots. And there's some people saying a lot of bad things about him. He might have been discouraged, but as soon as he finds out Thessalonica is doing well, he is on cloud nine. Why? Because he cared about their success, not his own. He looked at them and said, if you are successful, I am successful. Question, is that how you operate in your relationships? This is, by the way, this is a game changer for you. Is this how you operate in relationships or do you simply see people for what you can get out of it? Now they do say birds of a feather flock together. So oftentimes we end up as friends with people that we share interests with. But if that person suddenly becomes difficult, and by the way, this is how you can tell where you are. If that person suddenly becomes difficult and your first response is cut them out of my life, then you're in the relationship for what you can get out of it and as soon as they stop giving you that, you don't wanna be a part of it anymore. The key is to love one another and seek their good. The key is to invest into their life and see their success as your success. Have you ever, you ever worked for somebody who is just a selfish person that, that no matter how hard you work, they took credit and they used it to build themselves up and get themselves things? You don't wanna work for that person. You won't work for that person, in fact. You'll do the minimum in order to not get fired so you can find another job that's gonna help you climb a ladder someplace or be more successful. That's what normal people do. But what if you had a boss that said, your success is gonna be my success. If you're successful, I'm gonna give you everything, your encouragement, money, tools, everything you need in order for you to be successful so that when you stand up there and get a reward, that's gonna be for both of us. Whoa, that would be an awesome person to work for. What if you were that friend to somebody else? just like Timothy is to the church here in Thessalonica on behalf of Paul. I want to read you something else Paul wrote to the church in Philippi in chapter 2. He says, therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. 
That changes, guys, this is game changer time for relationships. When you look out for the interest of others and not yourself only, it's not, it's not wrong to look out for your own interest, but if you're only looking out for your own interest, then it's a selfish person and that ruins relationships. My daughter is playing soccer. We had this awesome tournament yesterday. We went up to Bradenton and she got to be a part of it. And, and it's fun for me because I get to be playing sports again, kind of. Through her, I get to be a part of it. And I'm, I'm a little bit competitive, little. But it would reminded me as we had a conversation on the way home yesterday of when I played sports and I was younger, there was a person on my basketball team who um, his mom wanted him to be successful. And so she felt like he wasn't shooting the ball enough. So she told him, I'll give you $2. And by the 1995, this was a lot of money. I'll give you $2 for every shot you take, whether you make it or not. You know what he did? He threw that ball up every time it touched his hands. Oh, he made 50 bucks on the day but we lost the game royally, and, and, and nobody liked him anymore. Why? Because he only looked at the team, and he looked at the game for what he could get out of it. He was not committed to the team, he was committed to himself. He used everybody else to get what he wanted. And we lost as a result, the whole team got brought down. This is what it's like in relationships with one another. If we look at people for what we can get, then at the end of the day, you'll only have yourself. But if you look at people for what you can do for them and how you can build them up, it will be a mutually encouraging and beneficial relationship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a best friend, whether it's a coworker or a boss or somebody you've never met, this will change everything. And by the way, this is Jesus. Is that not what he did? He said to love one another, he said, as I've loved you. And look at what Paul continues to say. For, we give, or for what thanks can we render to God for you and all the joy which we can rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Man, he just wants to be there to encourage, to help keep them going. Seek the good for others. That will change everything for you. There is said, it has been said there are those who love people and are willing to sacrifice for their good and there are those who love themselves and will sacrifice people for what they want. Let, us not be said, let that not be said of us. Verse 11, Paul says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. Verse 11 through 13, Paul says, writes his prayer out for the church. This is so cool because um, you see this with the Apostle Paul, you see this with different people within the scriptures that God does something great or they're very excited and, and they either break into spontaneous prayer or spontaneous worship. It just seems to go one of two ways. And Paul here decides he's gonna write down his prayer for this church and so he does, he, he says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. His prayer, number one, first and foremost, God, will you please make a way for me to see this church again? Right, there's nothing like being face to face, giving a hug, having a cup of coffee, eating a burger, that's a church I wanna go to. Amen, yes. He says, I want to be with you. Lord, make my way to you. Do you guys, a few years ago when, when, when COVID hit, um, when the church shut down, the most awkward thing in the world for me was when we, we, were, we were videoing the sermon so everybody could be at home and we we're putting all that together. The most awkward thing in the world for me was preaching to an empty sanctuary. Nobody there, I, 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 it, I couldn't do it, it was so hard. And so at the time, our youth minister took a bunch of teddy bears and set them up in the chairs. And I was like, that does not help, bro. They like, I just dropped solid gold jokes on them and their facial expression didn't change at all. They just stared at me with their little beady eyes. It was terrifying, it wasn't good. But the best part was when everything was over and we all came back, right? because there's nothing like physically being together. There's just, it's just that you can't replace that. You can't replace the fellowship of the church with TV or online, nothing. Being there face to face, this was Paul. I wanna be there, I wanna be there face to face. I wanna perfect what is lacking in your faith. I wanna be with you, I wanna teach you, I wanna do life with you. 
And then here in verse 12, he says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. This was Paul's prayer for them, that they would continue to love, that they would be blameless and holy, and that he could come and see them. What a beautiful prayer. Our third and final point What does love practically look like when it's played out? Number one, you check in. Number two, you're seeking their good. Number three, pray for them. Pray for them. And, and, you know, it's not just a simple making mention of someone in your prayers. No, it's prayer. In chapter five of the same book we have here, Paul says, um, pray without ceasing, rejoice always. And these are commandments. Do this. Something happens when we pray for one another. There's a few things that change when we begin to pray for people. Number one, it takes your eyes off of offenses. It takes your eyes off of offenses. Do you have somebody in your life that's a little bit hard to be around? They're called EGR people. Extra grace required. Sometimes you have people in your life that just rub you the wrong way. They're just hard to be around. They may be challenging, but if you're seeking their good, pray for them. Otherwise, in your flesh, you'll simply focus on what about them you don't like. And then that builds up and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Pray for them. Get your eyes off of the offense, especially if they've offended you. If you're hurt and you're upset, pray for them. Number two, you invest into somebody when you pray for them. You're investing into the outcome of their life. When you pray for them, you're investing into them. Um, not long ago, I don't remember, how, actually, I don't remember how long ago it was. It's probably been over a year, maybe two. I was um, just studying, and the Lord revealed to me something about my own personality that I really needed to work on. It was that I needed to listen more. It was listening. Um, I tend to jump in, you know, because I know the answer already, especially as soon as you start talking about a problem, I already know the answer, let's get it done so we can move on. That's just my personality. But in relationships, it's important to listen. And so I came to my wife, and I said, the Lord revealed to me that I need to listen more. And she says, thank God I've been praying for you forever. And I'm like, out loud? Because I didn't hear that. She goes, you weren't listening? No. (laughs) She did not say that, it was just a joke, but it's true. You pray for them, you get your eyes off of the offense, and then you invest into that person and it brings you, number three, more in line with Jesus Christ. You say, how? Well, I think our prayers oftentimes, <laughs> oftentimes we start out trying to change God's mind and then God, through prayer, begins to bring us in line with his desires. The more we pray for people, the more in line we come with God and his desires for other people's lives, for our life especially. When we begin to pray for other people, it brings us in line with Jesus because eventually you'll stop, if they've really offended you, eventually you'll stop praying hell and brimfire on them and begin to pray for God to change their heart and then perhaps even pray that God will change your heart toward them. And that brings a relationship together and finally you will see God work. When you pray for people and you see those prayers be answered, You know you were praying for that, you see God's handwork, and then you get to take part in that. This is why prayer is so important in relationships. I have done this plenty of times, and and my wife and I went to a marriage thing a a long time ago, and this was something they said, men, pray for your wives. Set a timer on your phone. So I did, I set a timer. And at first I found it very challenging, not because, you know, not for any other reason, and I tend to just pray short, you know? And, and, and the longer I prayed, the more things I thought about it, the more things I prayed, it was just like, man, and, and you start investing into that person and the relationship changed. Guys, I can't emphasize this enough. Number one, check in with them. Number two, seek their good. And number three, pray for them. This is what love practically looks like as it's played out in a relationship. Maybe you weren't modeled these kinds of things, but it's no excuse for not doing it now. God has called you and will equip you and encourage you and and guide you into these kinds of things because the entire Bible is about relationships. The entire Bible is about a relationship with God and our relationship with one another. Our love for God is shown in the relationships that we have with the people around us. So check in with them. Probably at some point while we were in this message today, somebody's name or face came to mind. I would encourage you right now to write that down. Write down that name and don't forget. So you, so you don't leave here and be like, oh, okay, that was a message for today. No, no, no. Put this one into action and see if God doesn't begin to work in your heart. 
We'll pray these things together.